Okay, hello. We're going to go ahead and get started now. My name is Linda. I'm on the education team at Power to Practice. And welcome to our webinar, Adrenal Dysfunction and Integrative Treatment Strategies, hosted by Power to Practice, the first and only EMR and patient portal designed specifically for integrative, anti-aging, and functional medicine practices. Before we begin, I would like to run through just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the slideshow and lecture portion of our webinar will last approximately 45 minutes, and we plan to save about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. If you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat box. Again, my name is Linda, and I will funnel all of the questions to Jim, our presenter. If you think of additional questions later after the webinar is completed, please email them to Jim Paoletti for response. We will put his email address up on the last slide um, so you can take note of that. Otherwise, um, just type them in the chat box, which is located on the GoToWebinar control panel. And Jim will do his best to answer each question during the Q&A portion, yet keep an eye out for a follow-up blog, which will arrive through our newsletter early next week. In that blog, we will post a recording of today's webinar, along with all of the questions and answers. In addition, we have made a PDF version of the webinar slides available for download from here in the webinar, and that PDF does include some hidden slides that are not in the presentation, so be sure to download that. To download, locate the bar labeled Handouts on the GoToWebinar control panel. Click there and uh, go ahead and try that out now before we get started. Of course, we will have all of the audio set to mute with exception of our presenter, Mr. Jim Paoletti. Jim has a Bachelor's of Science in Pharmacy and is a graduate and former faculty member for the Fellowship of Functional Medicine. He is also the Director of Education at Power to Practice and is a clinical consultant with over 30 years of experience creating and using bioidentical hormone therapies in both retail pharmacy and clinical practice. Jim is a nationally recognized expert in pharmacy, BHRT, and custom compounding, and has previously served as the Director of Provider Education for ZRT Laboratory and Education Director for the Professional Compounding Centers of America. At Power to Practice, Jim applies his wealth of knowledge and expertise by holding live webinars such as this one and creating useful content such as blogs, podcasts, and clinical support tools. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Jim, and we shall get started. Okay, thank you, Linda. Thank you. All right. Um, when ready, show my screen. Can you see my screen yet? Yes. Are you able I, to see the screen, Linda? I can see it now. Okay. Good to go. All right. So we'll get started then. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to attempt to do something that uh, most people won't do who are familiar with adrenal dysfunction. I'm going to attempt to cover the basics of it in about 45 minutes. Uh, most presenters who present on adrenal dysfunction will request usually three to four hours to do a good, complete cover. That's why there will be a number of slides that are hidden in the presentation, but I went ahead and had them printed out in the PDF form because it, it's valuable information, uh, information such as like individual dosage guidelines and research on some of the individual agents I might mention. So we'll get right into it. I don't have much time to chit chat tonight. We'll just jump right into it. Uh, what I want to do is go over some of the physiological changes associated with, uh, hang on just a second, you still with me? Okay, associated with chronic stress and discuss the components of the assessment of adrenal dysfunction and discuss some treatment strategies. Okay, now when it comes to adrenals, everybody thinks right away of cortisol and occasionally they realize epinephrine and norepinephrine, but there's a lot more to the adrenals than that as far as hormones. The adrenals are also just the source of sex steroids, um, cortisone, cortisone, and aldosterone. The adrenals are the primary source of DHEA in both males and females. Uh, it's the source of 50% of testosterone in females, so 50% from the ovaries, 50% from the adrenals. And after menopause, it's the primary source for estrogen and progesterone, any that the woman still produces. In males, it's the primary source of DHEA again. It's also the primary source for estrogen and progesterone. And after andropause, it's the primary source for testosterone. Aldosterone, cortisone, and cortisol are all made only in the adrenals. So when we talk about adrenal uh, assessment and function, we're looking at all these hormones, not just the cortisol. 
Now, in front of you is a slide, chronic associate, conditions associated with chronic stress. And I started a slide years ago, and I got this many on there, and I stopped. I mean, basically, there is no uh, aging disease of the Western society that is not in the literature in some way correlated with either aggravation or cause as far as chronic stress. So it, chronic stress is associated with all the different types of problems that we see. Okay? Everybody's stressed. This is a diagram taken from Dr. James Wilson's book, uh, Adrenal Fatigue, the 21st Century Syndrome, and he's trying to impress all the different sources of stress we have. And, and sometimes I'll occasionally have a patient says, well, I'm not stressed. And that's when I show him this. And I'll say, you're not stressed, huh? And, and I think Dr. Wilson has missed a couple of, of the major ones there that, that I've added to my little diagram. I put one, a box up there that says work, employment, okay, because a lot of people are stressed by their job. The other one is guilt. Um, I, I don't like asking a patient or telling a patient you need to manage your stress because all of a sudden it's like they have control of their stressors and they can do something about it. No, so you create this, this guilt. Feeling that, you know, and that's what our society does sometimes, make people feel guilty for not being able to handle their stress in their life. So everybody's stressed. So you will not see too many patients that have hormone imbalances that have really good adrenal, adrenal function, um, especially the perimenopausal woman. The majority of them have some, of, some degree of adrenal dysfunction. So that's why we're going to go over talking about how we're going to assess that and treat it. Okay, important thing to remember. The stresses that work on the adrenal glands are both additive and cumulative. So the effects of the stress over the years, your, where your adrenals are today, is a response to the stresses you've had for how many ever years you've been stressed. And it's going to vary with the number of stressors, the intensity, and how long the stress occurs. Now what happens most commonly, you will see a patient all of a sudden take a dive as far as their adrenal function and it's it's like the straw that broke the camel back. You you the stressors have just built over a long period of time and all of a sudden a major stressor comes along and that sends them in to adrenal dysfunction big time and the symptoms come on pretty rapidly. But this is all effect that's happened over years. Okay. This is a diagram of the stress in the HPA axis. And as you can see when you're stressed you release CRH, which goes to the pituitary increases ACTH, and then the adrenal glands kicks out cortisol, DHA, testosterone, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and aldosterone. This is a normal physiological response. It's when you have excessive stressors over a period of time that becomes a problem, and you'll see why. You have physical effects that are part of the fight or flight response. These are normal responses, which are good. I mean, if, if you go back to the age of the caveman and comes across a saber-toothed tiger, He's either got to beat up this tiger or run fast enough to get away from him. So you have the increased blood pressure, heart rate, heart contraction, increased blood flow to the muscles because you need that muscle strength. You decrease blood flow to the areas that aren't really important at that time, like the kidneys, intestines, reproductive organs. Uh, pupils can dilate. You dilate the bronchial tubes so you get more air in there. You get a release of glucose. These are all good things for short-term flight or fight response. However, it's when these... Uh, effects become chronic, they're there all the time, they become detrimental. You also get an aldosterone imbalance. Initially when a patient's stressed, you get increased aldosterone production from the stimulation. If you have chronic stimulation, the production then starts to decrease. And then your progesterone that's normally metabolized at aldosterone can be shut down to production of cortisol, which lowers the aldosterone even more. So you get sodium potassium imbalances and, and blood pressure problems. Okay, And this creates salt cravings in patients. It also makes them intolerant to potassium. Many patients with uh, stage 2 or 3 or farther adrenal dysfunction, um, potassium will make them feel nauseous. Okay, This is a stereogenic pathway. And up in this area right here, you see pregnenolone all the sex steroids come from cholesterol. You see, pregnenolone, when you're stressed, what happens is your, your cortisol initially goes up, but eventually it will go down. So when cortisol goes down, you then shift pregnenolone and progesterone more toward the cortisol and less you, through either one of those pathways and less to aldosterone and less to the other sex steroids. So 
chronic stress, lowering cortisol, results in an imbalance of aldosterone, progesterone, pregnenolone, DHEA, testosterone, estrogen. So it messes up all your hormones. Okay. Initially, when patients are stressed, you, you get an increased DHEA and increased testosterone. And that's felt that that's because the genomic effects of testosterone and cortisol are opposite. You have an antibiotic steroid and a catabolic steroid. So when the catabolic steroid cortisol raises and is elevated for a period of time, the brain raises testosterone level to balance the genomic effects. And DHEA and cortisol have opposite effects genomically on the immune system and on glucose regulation. So again, raise the DHEA to balance some of the effects of this elevated chronic, chronically elevated cortisol. Okay. But then eventually, as cortisol levels fall off because the adrenals can't keep up with the demand and can't make enough cortisol, now you get the DHA and testosterone falling down. Okay, so one of the symptoms, one of the things you see with, with chronic stress is a decreased DHA and a decreased testosterone level. You also may see the decreased pregnenolone and progesterone because, again, they're shunted to make more cortisol. The body, the body looks at the choice of, do I need cortisol or progesterone? Okay, progesterone makes me feel good. Cortisol keeps me alive. So it favors cortisol, keeping it up over progesterone level. All these go together reflect symptoms of estrogen dominance. And it's, for instance, it's quite common to see stress cause hot flashes in women. Okay, this is a stress, and and, and it should say, I'm sorry, it should say, <laughs> uh, it's the thyroid axis. Okay, but what happens when CRH goes up? and cortisol goes up, they both suppress TSH. So you don't stimulate the thyroid gland the way you normally do. High cortisol also blocks the conversion of T4 to T3, right here. So you have less of your active T3, which automatically will increase conversion to reverse T3. So reverse T3 will go up. Reverse T3 blocks T3 at the receptor. So high cortisol, you suppress thyroid production, you in, increase production reverse T3 and decrease production to the active T3 molecule. High cortisol also decreases the receptiveness of the thyroid receptor. So on multiple levels, when you have high cortisol, it messes up thyroid function. Now when you get into chronic low cortisol, it also messes up thyroid function through a couple other mechanisms. It also, low cortisol, you don't get optimal thyroid receptor response. You also don't create as many thyroid receptors. Your density of thyroid receptors is less. And you also don't absorb thyroid into the cell as well. So whether you have chronic high or chronic low or you're fluctuating back and forth, abnormal cortisol levels mess up thyroid. Okay. So again, you suppress TSH, decrease the conversion in active hormone, increase conversion to the blocker, reverse T3, decrease the function of thyroid receptor, and get low receptor density and transport within the cell. So let's talk about how we assess these patients. We all have them, okay? Now, I, I on my assessment, it's got to be everything. You can't do part of it. You got to have a patient history. I always look at my patient history, and I will talk to them in the interview and find out if they've had major stressors, especially if they have the symptoms. If they have the signs and symptoms of, of adrenal fatigue or adrenal dysfunction, I will ask them what kind of stressors they have in their life now, and I will always look for a major stressor any time in the last year or two. Uh, up to 18 months especially. Um, but there are some clinical tests you can look at, and then we'll talk about how you can measure it too. But it's usually putting the whole thing together that gives you a good idea of what's going on. And I'll show you some examples of that. Okay. So again, if you have acute stress, you get this immediate response of high cortisol and high glucose followed by high insulin. And this is not the patient that's coming to you and complaining about symptoms. Okay. Yes, this is a normal response. The patients you'll see are suffering from chronic stress. Okay, um, the net result, if you have high cortisol for a long period of time, is you get increased fat storage and you lose growth hormone component. So women will increase their weight and they will have other symptoms like fatigue, irritability, low thyroid symptoms. There's a whole list of, of symptoms of excess cortisol and lack of cortisol. And those, by the way, we can make available to you. They're also uh, in my book um, that I've written, The Practitioner's Guide to Functional Physiological Hormone Balance. Um, I have a whole chapter on, 
on adrenal dysfunction, and I also have in my appendix symptoms of all of excess or deficiency of all the hormones, including adrenal hormones. So let's look at some adrenal dysfunction patterns so that you can recognize more of the patients that are suffering from this. Okay. When you have chronic stress, it elevates cortisol. Okay. Now that can be all day. It can be just at night. Some pa patients, you know, their stress is during, not during the day. They're, they're good at the job. They get home. They got to deal with four kids, two of them are teenagers and their husband, and, and now, now the stress comes about. And so they may just have their elevated cortisol at nighttime. It depends upon their circumstances and where their stressors are. Okay. Again, the adrenals pump out the cortisol and testosterone and DHEA. They all rise at first, and melatonin is the one hormone that decreases. Excess cortisol will actually block melatonin production. Low cortisol results in low melatonin also. Okay. Um, then the adrenals become low in reserves. They just cannot produce the hormones. There's another reason why cortisol will go down too. Um, this process of, of high cortisol, you can get inflammation affecting the hippocampus, damage in the hippocampus. And there's another school of thought that sometimes the hippocampus shuts down that HPA axis response so that it's self-protective, protects the hippocampus. Either way, your cortisol production goes down. And you usually see it fall below normal, uh, not necessarily all day long, but initial adrenal dysfunction, you'll see it fall below normal once or twice a day. So a patient can, at this point, exist with a high cortisol, maybe in the morning at night, low during the day. Again, I'll show you some examples here in a, in a minute so you can recognize some of these. Um, usually, in, if, if there was a tendency, the morning cortisol is the last to fall. It's not, it doesn't always hold true, but usually what I see is, is you see the daytime cortisols fall first, the, the noon and the evening, and then the night, and then the morning. If I, if, there had, if I had to pick a typical pattern, that would be it. But what you commonly see is the cortisol may be previously high levels, dropping down now, you may even have the cortisols pretty well and normal throughout the day because they're falling down and you just happen to catch most of them in the normals. But you'll, if you look at your testosterone and DHEA, you'll see at least the DHEA, if not both of them, below normal. So that's how I recognize adrenal dysfunction in patients. I'll show you more specifically some examples here, but I look at the symptoms. If a patient has symptoms of both high and low cortisol, they have adrenal dysfunction. Then I'll, I, I will look at their cortisol levels four times a day, as I'm going to show you. But the next thing I look at is I look at their androgens. And if their DHA and testosterone are both low, then I know they have adrenal dysfunction. It guarantees it. Even, I don't even have to look at a cortisol pay, pattern. And you can have patients that have symptoms of high and low cortisol, low androgens, and their cortisol pattern may look fairly normal. It's because they're falling from high to low, and it's just happened that they, you caught most of their levels throughout the day near normal. And that can fool you. If you just looked at cortisol pattern in that patient, well, you say the cortisol's not so bad. But if they've got symptoms and they have low androgens, then that's what I call stage two adrenal dysfunction. The cortisol's coming down, and it's going to keep falling if you don't address it at that time. Okay. What you'll see is certain energy patterns with adrenal dysfunction. Um, it's these people, that, that the most common complaint is fatigue. It's especially so in the morning for most of these patients. Okay, Cortisol is what gets you up and gets you going in the morning. That's it. With the first 30 minutes, cortisol goes up to its highest level of the day. That's what gets you up and gets you going. So if you're low on cortisol, it's hard to get up and get going. And people are fatigued, and they'll tell you they can be fatigued all morning. Um, sometimes they'll get a meal or a snack, a good snack, partway through the morning, and that gives them an artificial raise of energy, okay? Um, but it's not due to cortisol usually. It's usually due to the carbohydrates and the sugar or the nicotine or the caffeine or something else they're replacing the cortisol with. But then they'll get it after lunch. If they've eaten something, that will give them energy, raise it back up, and then they have the mid-afternoon low energy, okay? So you can, you can see a common pattern in patients, and I'll – tell you about that here as we go along, um, between their correlation between their eating and their energy and adrenal dysfunction. Okay? Interesting enough that adre in adrenal dysfunction, many patients get more energy in the evening. They actually do better in the evening. They, they can drag in the morning. You'll have patients tell you, 
yeah, it's hard to get up. I'm tired in the morning. I get up. I, I get going for a little bit, but an hour later, I'm back in bed. I'm just too tired. I'll sleep for another hour. And I get up, and I'm dragging all day, but yeah, in the evening, I'm good. I don't know why. I'm good. But then they tire out at 9 or 10. They may not be able to get to sleep. They may have sleep issues, but they start feeling tired. And then if they do stay up, they get another burst of energy later. But if you ask these people if they ever go back to bed, maybe on the weekends, a day off, um, they'll they sleep really, really well first thing in the morning, early in the morning. Okay, uh, They will have cravings for high-fat food and stimulants. When the brain is low on cortisol, its main stimulant, it makes patients crave for substitutes, nicotine, caffeine, carbohydrates. And you will see that in all adrenal dysfunction patients, that just almost across the board. Because the aldosterone imbalances also crave salt. Okay? Um, and as I mentioned before, the high intolerance is potassium too. Now some clinical indications. Blood pressure, uh, it'll drop by 10 millimeters per mer of mercury upon rising. In other words, when they, if they tell you when I get kind of dizzy or lightheaded, when I stand up too quickly. Uh, pupil contraction really works. The iris cannot hold contraction when you shine a light at it. Uh, Sargent's white line is kind of cool. If you take a blunt instrument and press it hard across the abdomen, you know, you get this white line and if you normally it's going to turn back to red you know it's, it, it normally turn red the color comes back right away but if you're adrenally deficient it remains white for several minutes and, and I, I've seen that before and there's Rogor sign that's pain or tenderness over the adrenals and that can be severe I remember years ago when Dr. James Wilson and I were at a, a seminar together that I was hosting uh, he warned me that I was becoming adrenally fatigued and I kind of said kind of blew it off and said, no, I'm just burning a candle. I'm kind of tired right now. He said, come here. And he turned around and he pressed his hand on my adrenals. Of course, he's an adrenal guru, so he knew exactly where to push. And he didn't have to push that hard, and he dropped me to one knee. And I had tears in my eyes. I said, okay, I'll take care of myself. So it, it can be very pain, painful or tender. If you know the right place to push, don't push hard on these patients. Okay? Yeah, you can get a generalized cervical uh, lipidentist. Um, your skin, some of these things like the skin tendency to dry and thin, the perspiration skinny, those are really probably through that mechanism of lowering thyroid function. In fact, most of adrenal dysfunction patients, if not all, will have signs and symptoms of low thyroid. It is very rare that you don't see them go hand in hand. So, if you want an assessment of adrenal function, there's a couple ways you can do it. In the book, Adrenal Fatigue by Dr. James Wilson, uh, there is a question in, questionnaire in there. I think it's, I don't know, 11, 12 pages. Um, it's an objective questionnaire. I had patients fill that out um, if, if they're questioning whether they're adrenally fatigued or not, or they don't want to do their saliva testing to give me a cortisol measurement. I'll start with that. I don't give them the last section that tells what their score means. I make them score, give it to me, and then I'll interpret it for them. Um, Sometimes I'll have patients that either do the saliva testing wrong or they don't want to do the testing or, you know, the Medicare is not covered or a reason like that. If I have to, I'll, I'll go to an energy intake three-day diary. And what this is, I just have them rate throughout the day their energy level on a scale of 1 to 10 at least every two hours. I tell them if you if you are thinking about it and you want to do it more often, that's fine. If you, you know, as long as you feel really tired, and write it down a time and you know, rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. And then also, on the other half of the sheet of paper, record any food, liquid, nicotine, recreational drugs, anything like that that you take in. And what you will see in the adrenally dysfunctional patient is you will see as the energy levels go down, it will be followed by stimulant intake. And following the stimulant intake is an increase in energy. So if you see that pattern throughout the day, you know, they're, they're, they, they're fatigued, um, then their energy goes up and you look back, well, before that, yeah, they had a break. What did they have at their break? Coffee, Pepsi, candy bar, potato chips, you know, and then they get tired again and guess what? Their energy goes up. You look, yeah, that's after lunch. So you can see that pattern in these patients. Um, helpful. Helpful. Uh, actual testing is what I like. Um, now, you can do a 24-hour urinary cortisol, and if it's in the bottom third of the range, you've probably got adrenal dysfunction. Um, the, the, the thing about a 24-hour urinary cortisol, though, is 
if you have a patient that has high morning and high night cortisol and they're low at noon and the evening, they cannot come, come up with the same total score as a person who's perfectly normal in their cortisol pattern. So it shows you when there's a deficiency or that you probably won't see too many patients come in with high cortisol levels because they don't have enough complaints to see a practitioner. But it, it'll show you a deficiency, but it doesn't do the same thing as a saliva testing where you're collecting that four times a day because now you can see the pattern throughout the day. And the pattern throughout the day as you're going to see is going to help you determine how this patient has to address this what treatment modalities you should uh, use. So saliva is by far the most beneficial way to, to look at this. You, they do it four times in one day, and they do it on, I try, tell patients, try to pick a normal stress day. In other words, you don't get to do it on Sunday. That's a nice relaxing day for you. You don't do it on Saturday because you're taking care of your kids, all your kids while your husband's out playing golf, and you're running them all over, and you're trying to get your laundry done. And you're, you, you know, Try to pick your average stress day and do it on that day if possible. Okay. Always test the androgens and get your estradiol and progesterone at the same time so we can see what's going on. Hormone balance is about balancing all the hormones together, thyroid, adrenal, insulin, and all the sex steroids. So you always want the complete picture for the patients. And if possible, get a blood sugar at the same time so we can get a good picture of what's going on in the patient. Okay. Now, this diagram represents the problem with testing in general, I should say. You know, if you have Addison's disease or Cushing syndrome, okay, any doctor will take care of you. The problem is, is there are a lot of patients that are over here to the left in the blue, over the right in the pink, that have too little cortisol or too much cortisol on a regular basis, and they're not getting the optimal level, so they have symptoms. But they aren't treated by conventional medicine because they're not in a range of the quote-unquote disease state. These patients that are in the blue, or what we're going to be taking care of. Sometimes we get the ones in pink, but more often than not, these we're talking about the patients that are in the, in the blue, hypoadrenia or hypocortalism. So what I want to do now is show you a few example saliva tests. Okay, and in the lower right hand corner here, here's the graph of these cortisol levels. You can see here's cortisol morning in a normal range. Well, this is graphed out down here. Down here, this green and yellow area is the normal range is the yellow from here to here, and then the green is the uh, getting into the optimal. Okay, so let me see if that yeah it blows up a little bit. So here's a patient comes in, their test they have high cortisol all day long. Don't see these too often. Uh, cortisol is your stimulant hormone, so these patients have energy. They have energy all day long. When people have energy, they can tolerate a lot. Um, and even though they may have some problems coming along, like they're starting to put on weight, high cortisol will cause weight, they have the energy to exercise. They have the energy to mentally function at work, etc. So don't see that many patients that come in with high cortisol occasionally, um, but rare. Now here's another patient comes in. <coughs> Again, this patient tested high all day long. But as you can see in the evening, they drop they drop down in, in, to within a normal range, and not quite high all at all. They drop down a normal range in noon and night, but they peak back up there again in the evening. Now, that peak could be caused by they have extreme stressors in the afternoon. Maybe it's after school, the kids get home, um, something like that. She gets home from work and has to prepare dinner and get the kids' homework done, or maybe stressed out, something like that. In this case, this patient particularly. Um, was a good example. This patient actually worked out after work and then went home and spit. Uh, so she collected her saliva within probably 20, 30 minutes after a workout, which will raise your cortisol. So if she hadn't done that, it might have been all down to normal. So she would have only had high cortisol in the morning. Uh, here's another example. And this one, this patient, um, if you look at the brown line, this is optimal down to low, 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 and this was in December of 06. So this patient has low levels three of the four times, right, okay, in the morning. That patient probably had cortisol levels that were dropping, okay? Um, and after some treatment, you see the next time they came back, their morning cortisol was a little bit high, um, but we're getting back up to normal in the other ones. But this is you know, everybody has a different pattern. So in this patient, I'm looking at the fact that I need to kind of even this out. 
Uh, we'll talk about adaptogens, and that's kind of what I would lean toward on this patient. Here's a patient that starts out, this is a kind of a weird level, starts out low in the morning and then gets up to high normal and then drops down low again. Now, you could have a patient do this. Maybe they're just, you know, their, their output is low normally, but their stressors are at work in the morning and what when they can't get any cortisol kicked out, uh, they do it at noon. But if they're low in the morning, it usually almost always keeps going. Uh, in this case, this patient is a night worker, works night shift. And uh, almost all the functional medicine practitioners I know will tell you the same thing. You just don't fix night shift people. You can't get the cortisol levels to work out. You can't get their melatonin to work out. And it's sometimes difficult to get their other hormones worked out. So this, this pattern is typical of somebody that works night shift. Their circadian rhythm, which is really important, the cortisol production is all messed up. Now, if you look at the blue line on this one, if that blue line was a little bit higher in the morning, let's 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 say this blue dot in the morning was up here and high, so it went up to down to down and back up, kind of a U shape. That's what I say is, is a typical pattern of a patient that's like an adrenal dysfunction stage two. They still have some cortisol production. They're high in the morning. They're high in the evening, or high at night, but they're low throughout the day, and that patient will eventually drop down on all four and become flat line. Okay. Here's a patient who starts out really high in the morning, and by nighttime they're really low. So considering some of those other patients that we showed you that had high cortisol all day long or went high and then down and back up high, if you just did cortisol once a day in the morning, you'd treat all those patients the same. You'd try to suppress cortisol production. If you suppress cortisol production completely throughout this patient, you're going to make them feel worse during the day because that that high cortisol in the morning is the only thing that keeps them going. If that started out in a normal cortisol in the morning, it would be flatlined the rest of the day, and they would just completely run out of energy. So you've got to be careful in patients. If you, you've got to know what the cortisol does throughout the day so that you don't overreact one or, once or twice a day and, and treat that and not know the whole picture. Again, if you go back to that U-shape, if you just did the morning and nighttime cortisols in that patient, you come back and your impression is this patient's got high cortisol. You do some things in therapy to suppress their high cortisol. That person has low cortisol during the day, you make them feel worse during the day. You might get them to sleep better, but you're going to make them feel worse throughout the day. That's why I always do a four-point cortisol. I want to see the pattern of what's going on. Uh, and here's a patient that's about to flatline. Again, normal in the morning, but low or low normal the rest of the day. And here's what you see when they're adrenal fatigued. Actually, adrenal dysfunction stage four. They no longer produce cortisol. And this is an actual patient, and this patient uh, basically couldn't function, just no energy. I mean, was drinking like 12 Diet Pepsis a day and still unable to, to function. Okay, so let's talk about treatment strategies. Let me see what time it is, 7.35. We're good. Okay. I'm going to talk about lifestyle adjustments, nutritional uh, supplements, adaptions, postural serum, let's just get into it and talk about it. What I teach patients is you have to, you, you can't manage your stress. You have to deal with it. Okay? You have to identify what stresses you, and if you can eliminate the stressor, do it. If you if you have coworkers that get together with you at your 10 o'clock break in the morning, and these two coworkers, all they do for the 15-minute break is bitch about how terrible their job is, you need to get away from them. That's not helping you. You need positive stuff around you, not negative. So in some cases, you can eliminate the stressors. If you have a friend who's a stressor, uh, and my wife went through this recently, best friend for years, finally just said, I can't do this anymore. And, and I just saw the change in her instantly. I mean, the next day, she's just stress is gone. Okay, But most people can't eliminate their stressors. You, you can't give the kids away. You can't shoot your husband. You can't you know, tell the boss off. So what you have to do is you have to change your response to the stress. I call it stress response adaptation. Okay, um, You have to recognize, anticipate, and try to balance stressful events. And I, and I do that through what I call compensation techniques. Compensation techniques would be anything the patient tends, enjoys doing that takes their mind off the world. Prayer, meditation, walking, swimming, riding a bicycle. I don't care, but you do it without your cell phone on. 
it doesn't involve a computer being anywhere. Now, you get your mind off the world. Tell your family you need the bathroom or the, the spare bedroom from 9 o'clock to 9.15 every night, and you are not to be disturbed. And go in there and do something you enjoy doing. It really, really is important to chill that HPA axis on a daily basis to get your adrenals back in good shape. I had a patient recently. She has three children, one in first year in college and two in high school. She works full time and she's taken, she's working toward a PhD or doctorate or something and she has to drive from her hometown to New Orleans which is about I think an hour and a half drive it one way and she does that two or three times a week. So I'm thinking right away at first, okay, we're going to have some stress issues. She actually, her cortisol levels came back fine, her symptoms were bad as far as that. I'm going like, wow. Well, it ends up that she realized she had to take care of herself and she plays music and sings in her drive back and forth. And she says, when I'm not driving, I make sure my husband and I sit down for at least 15 minutes and have a glass of wine and talk. And she does these compensation techniques as part of her lifestyle. And it's like I showed her to some other people and said, and then everybody said, oh, I showed her lifestyle. And they said, oh, she's going to be stressed. And they all go, wow, she's not. It's the compensation techniques. It's probably one of those beneficial things you can do for patients for their adrenals. Okay. Um, it's important for these people to respond to the fact that they're tired. Take breaks. I even had I've had a couple occasions where I wrote letters to employee employers saying you have to provide a place for this patient to lie down at the rest. If you can't do that, we're going to have to get take her off work on a disability. Well, of course, you know they got the choice of disability, or I'm going to give her a place she can lie down. Okay, uh, very important. I tell them to lie down, and, and, and their days are not working. Boy, if they can get rest, do it. Okay. Exercise is good if it's care of them, then you'll be able to increase it. In a while, go to bed at 9 or 9.30, if at all possible. Get in bed. And then I go over some techniques on how they can better sleep, like get all the lights out of the room, get the TV out of the room, you know, et cetera. Um, and I tell them on the days they can sleep in. You gotta, you gotta put the spouse in charge sometimes. Just get, you know. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to the spouse and say, look, you want, you want her to get better? It's up to you. You've got to, you've got to take some more responsibility. Let her rest more. Just give her six months, and then she'll be doing better. And then I tell them if you don't help her out, then in six months you're going to be doing a lot more because she's not going to be able to. Love, laughter, um, diffusing tension, anything that uh, adrenaline challenge to stop watching the news and and mystery shows and stuff like that. Puts if you're gonna watch TV, put something on that makes you laugh. If you don't, if, I asked this one guy one time, what makes you laugh? He says Three Stooges. I said, okay, here's your prescription. Go to the movie store and buy some 3D movies, and that's what you're watching. Of course, his wife didn't like the Three Stooges, so she wasn't happy. But he loved it. Example of this I've ever seen is I went to dinner more than once with. Hello, hello, this is Linda. Um, Jim, if you can hear me, we are not able to hear you. The phone keeps cutting in and out. Shucks. I don't hear you at all any longer. Well, we seem to have lost Jim. 
I don't hear him. I've sent him a message. Oh, okay. I see his screen moving. Um, Are you there? Can you hear yes, me now? Yes, you're back, Jim. Yay. Okay, please continue. All right, yes. I don't know. Uh-oh, you're gone again. Okay, I'll hang up the phone now. So if anyone does need to go, you can type um, your questions in the chat box, and we will have Jim answer them recorded here on the call, or you can also email jim at powered. The person you are trying to reach is not. Hello? Hi. Okay, I can hear yeah. you now. Uh, um, do you have any idea where we left off on this? Cut out. Hmm. Well, no. All right. Let me just close this up real quick. Okay. We had. Okay. Uh, we let had me just good, close up real quick. Okay. We had a good minute where we couldn't hear you. So if you're able to guess. Okay. Well, I just went. I just went over that one one slide. Uh, everything's there on the slide that I said. Okay. Um, I want to wrap this up real quick and just tell people in the slide now you can see the important things uh, that you want to read through this because you're not going to remember if I read through it for you right now anyway. Right. I put everything there. Talked about the different types of things. What I want to mention real quick is what I use routinely in patients, all patients that are stuffed, are adaptogens. Because adaptogens help you adapt. It, it, they, they chill the HPA axis. So it keeps as much cortisol, it keeps cortisol from being released to the same degree when people are stressed, which if you do that over time, then lower cortisol levels come up come up too. So it evens up cortisol levels. Glandular extracts I use for patients that are lower than normal cortisol levels at least twice a day and just are too tired to function. It helps them get their energy back quicker, but you don't have to use them. It just speeds up the recovery process. Um, the adrenal steroid therapy, I, I use hydrocortisone in some cases. Again, it's for the patients that can't function, but it's on a temporary basis. My guidelines are all in the handout and in my book. Okay. And DHEA, I put some dosages there for both male and female. Okay, testosterone, again, I gave some dosages. Um, there, it's all there. Um, some of the natural supplements I use to help with sleep. Okay, and then at the end, I, I put some different protocols in there, and I didn't even put, I hid most of them, but it's just what you can do for different stages of high or low cortisol. Okay. Um, and the different things to consider. And again, if, if that, I know we went through a lot quickly. I would have liked to spend a couple of hours just going over the protocols. But it, I do have it all spelled out in my book. And I also have, you know, available for questions now and, and anytime you guys want to email me. Okay, you still there? Yes, Jim. Um, I went ahead okay. and put the first question into a private chat. Okay, now i got to find that, don't I? Okay, um, so the private or okay, the Okay, yeah, I found it. How do you find a tennis spot for the adrenals? Um, Dr. Wilson has a uh, has a diagram in his book that shows you where the adrenals are. You can probably just Google it. Uh, Endotex.com uh, probably has a place that, that'll show you that too. Not being a physician, I'm not allowed to touch patients, so I've never had to practice that. Pharmacists aren't allowed to do that physical touch stuff, so we have to diagnose and analyze and stuff. Well, we don't diagnose, but we analyze without touch. But, uh, yeah, the best thing to do is if you're ever at a, a seminar of any kind, if you have somebody like a, a Dr. Lena Edwards or, or uh, Dr. Hyman or Dr. Laval or Dr. You know, one of these guys that's talked about adrenals, ask them to show you where the adrenals are. Unless you have adrenal fatigue, don't ask them because it'll hurt. How long does the patient do the compensation techniques? Um, I tell them, yeah, 20 minutes would be great. I tell them at the very minimum 10. I, I like, you know, I'd like them to do 20. But honestly, one thing that stresses a lot of patients out is their schedule. So I, I but what I, I'm honest with them, I said, look, you do it for 10 minutes a day for a month, and then you'll be wanting to do it for more. It's like getting people to walk, exercise. I don't have any time to do it. I tell them, look, start your front step, 
have a stopwatch or look at your watch, walk briskly for a minute, turn around, walk back, just do it two minutes a day for me. Well, you know, then they're up to five. Next thing you know, they say, man, the best part of my day is when I'm walking. They realize how important the compensation technique is. They enjoy that time, and hopefully they'll work up. But um, they can do it as often as they need to. I have, I have one lady who says, I do it two or three times a day now. Just make it part of my life tower routine. But you got to balance that with what, what you would really like them to do and the fact that one of the reasons they're there in the first place is their schedule is too stressful. And if you ask them to give too much time up front, then, then in the back of their mind, I'm not going to be able to do this. So you want to make it a, a reasonable request. So I tell them minimum of 10 minutes. But what I emphasize is has to be every day. How do you choose which adaptogens? Wow. Okay, uh, I'll be honest with you. If I'm in practice, I'd probably do muscle testing to find out which one works for which person. If I had to choose one adaptogen from the many that I've got listed and many good choices out there, probably ashwagandha because it helps support thyroid function too. But what I prefer to do, uh, especially because I do a lot of consults by Skype and phone, um, I will use a combination product. Okay, uh, Dr. Wilson has a liquid that has four different adaptogens in it. Um, uh, orthomolecular has a good combination. What you want to be careful about of adrenal combination products are this, though. You've got your vitamins and minerals that support the adrenals. you got your adaptogens. you got phosphoserine, which suppresses cortisol. you got your glandulars. I see a lot of companies trying to combine a little bit of glandular, a little bit of vitamin and mineral, an adaptogen or two, and they don't really have enough of the vitamins and minerals uh, either a complete picture of what's needed, as it's listed in my handout, or not enough of each one. Or they have a little bit of glandular, I'm going to like, you, it doesn't work a little bit of each one. What works is, hey, if they need an adaptogen, give them a combination of adaptogen. If, if you're not sure which one, use a, use a product that's got three or four different adaptogens in it. Like I say, Dr. Wilson's and Northam Molecular's are, are among my favorites to use um, as far as adaptogens. If you need a glandular because they're really dragging, um, get a pure one. Um, you can't go wrong if you use Dr. James Wilson's products because he originated these things. It's, everybody else is copying what he's done. And what I like about his products, you got the vitamin and mineral support in one, you got the glandulars in another, you got the adaptogens in another. So I can give each patient what they need. Okay, and if I need to suppress the cortisol more, I can always add some phosphoserine separately. Okay, Jim, what was the website that you mentioned for the first question? Uh, endotext, E-N-D-O-T-E-X-T dot com. I mean, you want to find a, a neat spot for endocrinology information, that's that's a great website. That's, that's yeah. Do I suggest, uh, why, do, why don't move? do I suggest Dennis Wilson's book? You know, I've, I've known Dr. Dennis Wilson for years, and when he first, the book, book came out, um, I wasn't really for it. Because what he does is give a high dose of T3. Now, what he's doing is patients produce too much reverse T3 when they don't make T3. And he's balancing that excess reverse T3. However, if you give T3 to patients more than 15 micrograms a day, you are suppressing their endogenous T4 production. Well, that's a good thing if you're making reverse T3 out of T4, but it's not a good thing to train your adrenals not to make T4. I mean your thyroid, not to make T4. So I prefer a slower approach as far as therapeutic effectiveness. I give the T3 separately, and I don't give those patients a poorly converting T4 until I help work on the conversion. But he's got some good stuff in his book, but I don't believe in high doses of, of T3 to balance a high reverse T3. I believe in addressing the causes of a poor conversion which if you read Dr. David Brownstein's book, Overcoming Thyroid Disorders, he has like 30-some causes of poor conversion. Uh, the, the, the ones I see the most often <coughs> excuse me, are uh, stress, uh, lack of certain nutritionals like zinc, chromium, um, iron. There's another one, iodine. They all affect the conversion. And then... Uh, too much alcohol. So I, I address the possible problems that are causing the poor conversion and then allow the reverse T3 to come down over time rather than give high doses of T3 like Dr. Wilson does. But on the good hand, 
over the last couple times I've heard Dr. Wilson speak, he's addressing those things now. When his book first came out, and I haven't read it, his, his updated version, but when his book first came out, I just talked about giving this T3. Now, he, when he presents, at least, I've heard him talk about doing the nutritional things and addressing the stress and the other things that cause the high reverse T3. If he's doing that, that's great. That part I'm all, all with. But I didn't, I didn't suggest Dennis Wilson's book. It was Dr. James Wilson's book that I suggested. Dr. James Wilson, it's called Adrenal Fatigue, the 21st Century uh, Syndrome. And I asked any physician or patient that has adren wants to deal with adrenal dysfunction or has adrenal dysfunction, please read that book. Thank you, Jim. Uh, this is Linda again, and I'm getting some messages in the chat that the PDF of the slides, there's something wrong with it. So I just uploaded the PowerPoint. That's not something we typically do, um, but you can download the actual PowerPoint here and print it. Um, take note, there are some hidden slides. I am going to fix this issue and I'm going to post a link to the PDF in the Power to Practice blog tomorrow morning. So you can also go there and check. And then does anyone else have questions? If you guys look through the power Yeah, if you look through the PowerPoint and you have questions, my email it'll be at the end of the PDF, it's on the slides. And another question, adrenal fatigue, the 21st century, what was the full name? 21st century syndrome. Syndrome, the 21st century syndrome. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions coming through. Maybe let's hang out for one more moment. Uh, the name of the thyroid book. Just got a question. Just couldn't hear the name of the thyroid book. Overcoming Thyroid Disorders. Overcoming Thyroid. By David Brownstein. Great. And the name of the website again. Endotex. E-N-D-O-T-E-X-T dot -E -E com. Endotex. Great. Okay. All right. Last call for questions. I missed this one question. Do you recommend a B complex with high vitamin B biscuit, vitamin B5? I usually give the B complex. I usually give a uh, uh, super adrenal stress formula, which is a combination of all the vitamins and minerals that are important for adrenal function. That's my favorite vitamin and mineral supplement that I have found for adrenals, super adrenal stress formula. And it says, how long does the energy go up for after taking a stimulant? Depends upon the patient. Depends upon where the cortisol level is and how much is stimulant. Uh, you know, it's a typical sugar rush thing. You know, if you have 10 people sit down and eat a candy bar, one of them will have a five-minute sugar rush. The other one will have a 55-minute rush. But, and it depends on just, you know, is it something they absorb that sugar quickly or is it a carbohydrate that they're breaking down over time? Is it nicotine that's absorbed quickly? Is it gone quickly? Um, so it's, it's your source of stimulation and how much you take and where the patient's energy level is to begin with. But um, usually an hour. If I had to say on average, you'll see energy start going back down after an hour. That's why I have them rate their energy at least every two hours so I can see it coming back down when it does. Discuss glandulars versus adaptogens. Okay. Adapt probably needed for everybody that's stressed. In fact, I use adaptogens prophylactically when I travel because I find travel stressful. Um, and if you've been a really dis dysfunctional Adrenal dysfunctional at one point in your life, you do everything you can not to go back there because it's so it's such a bad time. Um, so adaptogens are, are you can take any of these patients no matter where they are if they have some degree of adrenal dysfunction, or 
if it's a person that's stressed out, like a health practitioner that has a very busy schedule and they don't want to overwork adaptogens prophylactically. So everybody use adaptogens. If they're to the point where they have fatigue at all, you have a couple choices. You can do the adaptogens, the compensation technique, uh, the other things I put on there like water intake, sea salt, which is balanced minerals. And you can give them a vitamin mineral supplement that's meant to support their adrenals, and all those things will help the adrenals recover in time. Glandulars are something I tell people you don't ever need to use them, but they do, and nobody can tell you how exactly glandular works, but clinically what I see, it helps people recover quickly. Now, if you're fixing their hormones, uh, you got them on nutritionals to help their thyroid, you got them on the super adrenal stress hormone, you got them on adaptogen, you know, people get tired of taking too much. So one of the things that's optional in my mind is a glandular, okay? So I reserve the use of glandulars for people who don't care if they're taking another tablet, they have all the money in the world, or for those people that, look, you got to do something about my energy and you got to do it now. I want to get fixed quick. Those people, I will give them a glandular to start. I use Adrenal Rebuilder. It's a brand name. Um, and in those cases, if, if, if there's too many pills to take, I'll put off the super adrenal stress formula for a month or two, just get their energy back with a glandular and then work on their adrenals over time. So adaptogens in everybody, in most patients I use adaptogens in the, in the vitamin mineral formula, super adrenal stress formula, and then in patients that are really challenged energy-wise, fatigue-wise, I'll suggest adding the glandular to that to speed up the recovery process or somebody that just needs to recover now. Uh, what company has a super adrenal stress formula? Uh, uh, if you just go to adrenalfatigue.org, that, that's the website for James Wilson's information, and that's got the products there. I can't think of the name, his actual name of his company that he does that under CA, I think it is. It might be ICA. But adrenalfatigue.org is the website that you can find more information about those products. And if you contact them, tell them Jim Paoletti sent you. No, they won't charge you more. Do that. What if you have MTHFR? Yeah, then you're going to have to you're going to have to get the methylated uh, folic acid form. Um, what I do if they have MTHFR, I'll just add the methylated folate separately. Okay. What if heavy metal toxic? Ah, yeah. Fix adrenals or chelate first. Good question. It's like what. It's very similar. Okay, if they got hypothyroidism and they got adrenal fatigue, which will fix first? Well, you don't fix thyroid hypothyroidism without fixing the adrenals. You increase metabolism by fixing the thyroid, and the adrenals are weak, you tire them out. Well, you can work on the adrenals, but if you're heavy metal toxic, which probably added to the adrenal dysfunction a lot, you're not going to be successful. But there's no reason why you can't support the adrenals with compensation technique, proper water intake, eat good protein, get some minerals in there, vitamins and minerals, while you're doing the chelation. So if I have a heavy metal situation, I'm usually addressing both at the same time. That was a good question. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any more. Oh, there's one more. One more. One moment. Okay. I have to be careful. Loud. If they come in too fast, I miss <laughs> Any particular first. labs that you would recommend for selecting? Um, I will say I'm biased. Uh, there's only one lab that I use for saliva testing, and it's ZRT. Um, you know, when it comes to any type of testing, anywhere, any, uh, whatever modality you want, whatever lab you want, ideally what you want is a lab whose value clinically is relevant, okay? And to be clinically relevant, to me, it has to take into consideration, am I dosing this hormone? If so, when did I give the last dose, and what was the route of administration? Because the route affects the pharmacokinetics, which affects the level. There's only one lab in the world that does that. That's ZRT Laboratory. Their levels, they, they give you the information where you expect it to be based on the dose, and they have... Expected ranges for 12 to 24 hours after the doses. Nobody else does that. 
So it takes a lot of guesswork out of it. I also personally know from my experience that they are very high integrity at that lab. I mean, if, it, if it's a questionable test value, it's not going to be printed. Okay, if they don't do tests that are just to make money. It's to get the answer right. So yeah, I, I'm so. In fact, when I wrote my book, that's the only reference lab. That's the only lab I referred to. Period. That's just I do as much with them as possible. Now other people. I mean, if I'm doing uh, GI stool testing, comprehensive stool testing, yeah, Genova Lab is great. But as far as testing hormones, I don't think anybody does it better than ZRT Laboratories. Nobody, in my mind, nobody comes close to it as far as accuracy. But more importantly, the relevant information that they give you is, is just tremendous. And of course, um, Power to Practice does directly integrate with ZRT and Genova. Yeah, that's great. Uh, how how to stop the reverse T3 from converting if on armor already? Okay, if you're on armor, you are taking T4 and T3. And if you have a problem, if you're not converting well, if you don't convert T4 to T3, you automatically convert more to reverse T3 because those are your two major paths of metabolism of T4. Okay. What you need to do is look at all the causes of poor conversion. Again, Dr. Brownstein's book lists them. Um, I list them in my book. Um, you can probably Google poor conversion of T4 or T3 and come up with a list and correct those. Um, start with stress, get the cortisol levels down, and start with nutritional support. Okay. Um, most of your good, uh, most of your Good pharmaceutical or nutritional companies now have thyroid support products and, and can give you some information on that too. Okay, but once you work on the conversion, then the reverse T3 will come down in time. Now, if reverse T3 is real high, I've had in some cases doctors will temporarily take the patient off armor thyroid, just put them on plain T3, compounded T3, sustained release capsules for a while. That's all. That's an option too. Okay, next question. Let's say adrenals now adjusted. How do I add a T3 if already on armor and reverse T3 is high? Do I stop the armor and use only T3? Oh, I kind of addressed that just a second ago. It, it's, with thyroid there's so many things to consider. I can't give you a direct answer on that. If your adrenals are fixed and you're converting well, it's where are their individual levels? Where is their free T4 in its range compared to where the free T3 with, is within its range? And have you tested for autoimmunity? That's the first thing to do with thyroid. Have they got an autoimmune reaction? Because you have to address that first. Do they have a sufficient vitamin D level that their function, thyroid fun receptor function is, pro is proper? Do they have sufficient ferritin levels so you know they're transporting it uh, within the cell down the DNA? Um, thyroid is very complex. Complex. Um, when we get around to doing a webcast on thyroid, I'm going to make them break it down into at least three parts because it's just it, it's so complicated. Um, it's the longest chapter in my book, the chapter on how to functionally deal with hypothyroidism, um, and it takes a while to digest. But to, in answer to your question, I would probably uh, tell you in most patients, um, if they're on armor and their their adrenals are okay and they don't have any other medicines or excessive alcohol or something like that, nutritional deficiency that, that they should be converting okay, um, then you, you can leave them on the armor. But, but if you read my book, I have thyroid gradient levels in there. You can chart the results of your free T3 and free T4 tests. You don't even have to check the reverse T3 itself. You can look at the free T3 and free T4, and you can tell if that patient's converting well or not. I wish I could go into that more, but that's, that's a three-hour answer. Um, next question, what is your favorite panel with ZRT adrenal testing? I always use um, the female or male profile three, I think it's called. It's, it's where you test the cortisol four times a day. Um, I prefer saliva. Um, again, I want to I want to do it throughout the day. The urine testing is good for metabolites. I mean, if you're in measuring metabolite, that's, that's a really good way to do it, and, and I think they're doing an outstanding job with that. But my basic test to start with most patients, and, and a lot of my clientele is not uh, not well off money-wise, so you know I have to limit what I'm doing. I, I'm going to do I'm going to do a, a female profile three or a male profile three with ZRT, and that's going to give me the uh, the information I need to get hormones balanced, at least initially. They may have to do some serum testing. Uh, conventional serum testing for thyroid separately, but um, you can do serum, you can do thyroid 
on blood spot testing through ZRT2. So sometimes I'll get the uh, combination kit um, where they do the thyroid and the blood spot and then do the rest of the hormones and the saliva. Do you take patients off supplements prior to testing? Um, no, not unless it's something that's going to interfere. If you're not sure if it's going to interfere, the very best people to check with is the lab you're testing with. In other words, I had somebody call the other day. It was some kind of a supplement for menopausal woman, and I'd, I'd never heard of it. I said, you know, I could take a guess here, but why don't you, they test with ZRT. I said, why don't you call ZRT? They'll answer that question for any, anything you got. Um, and, that, you know, the people doing the test ought to be the one to tell you what, you're, what the patient's on will interfere with the testing. Um, but for most cases, no, you don't need to take them off the supplement prior to testing. Is your book available in Canada? Yeah, if you, if you can order from Amazon, you can get it in Canada. It's on Amazon.com. If you just type in my name under books on Amazon, it'll come up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. What a wonderful webinar. Um, we will post the PDF again on the website in the blog. And we will send an email probably within a day or two with the recording, but it will also be online on the blog as well. Thank you so much, Jim. And we'll You're see welcome. you back welcome. next month. All right. Okay. All right. Good night.